so thanks for coming along tonight. Uh, this function, as you know, was put on a very late notice, and we're very grateful to the Australia, Israel and Jewish Affairs Council for making this possible tonight. Now, I'll introduce our speaker very briefly, Nat Natasha Horsdorf. Halsdorf, I'm sorry, Natasha Halsdorf is a London barrister, is also director of the UK Lawyers for, uh, for Israel. She's studied at degrees from Oxford and Tel Aviv, been a fellow at Columbia University, worked in the law in Israel and, of course, in England, where she's a prominent barrister. But tonight, um, talking about the international legal war against Israel. You're very welcome. Thanks. Well, thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure to be here with you in Sydney. Um, as you heard, I am a barrister. And so I have to say I was a little surprised when I arrived in Sydney yesterday. And I was asked to declare whether I had any previous criminal convictions. <laughs> I, uh, I had thought that that was no longer a requirement. But, um, but uh, no, in all honesty, it's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege to be in this beautiful city. The weather has been outstanding. Um, and as it's my first time in Australia, I have had a lot to learn. Now, the international uh, legal war against Israel is something that has consumed a great deal of my time and attention for at least a decade. And although it is now a matter of prominence uh, and concern, plainly, for many. I have to break it to you that this is unfortunately not a new phenomenon. Already in 2011, I came across, at the time, an op-ed in the New York Times by Mahmoud Abbas, who is still president of the Palestinian Authority, um, in what was essentially his declaration of lawfare against the State of Israel. It was a piece advocating the merits of Palestinian uh, membership of the uh, supposed State of Palestine of the United Nations. And Mahmoud Abbas called for uh, the politicization of the conflict or uh, the legal aspects of this conflict, for it to be pursued as a legal, not just a political matter. That, as I say, uh, was Abbas's declaration of lawfare. It had unfortunately been a phenomenon that had developed even before that time through uh, armies of NGOs that have been set up and are extremely active at institutions like the United Nations with a sole purpose for many of them of demonizing the Jewish state and of utilizing legal processes and legal terminology as part of that lawfare exercise. Now, I see lawfare as an abuse of legal processes, and in this particular context, in particular, an abuse of international law. And the reason I think that that is extremely concerning is not just in respect of Israel. Yes, this is a case in point. This is a case study where it is clearly at its most prominent and most dangerous, but it has necessarily implications for the international legal order as a whole and implications for law-abiding states all over the world. Anyone who values rule of law and international legal order should be extremely concerned by the phenomenon that we are witnessing. And I thought it might be helpful in opening uh, remarks if I addressed a few examples and instances of where we have seen this playing out in respect of Israel. And this has been on uh, full display for some time at the UN Human Rights Council. NGOs like UN Watch have documented the number of resolutions targeting Israel, often making outrageous allegations against Israel in the context of international law couched in legal terminology. We have seen that also uh, manifested in the reports of special rapporteurs. The number of special rapporteurs that are appointed to address Israel in particular, many of whom with a track record in relation to the Jewish state, uh, which I wouldn't say is enviable, the reports that have been put out consistently adhere to that same narrative and that agenda of fabricating legal allegations against the state of Israel. And we have seen 
The knock-on implications of that phenomenon, as I say from special rapporteurs, from NGOs, at institutions like the UN Human Rights Council, we have seen more recently the knock-on effect of that at other international legal institutions, in particular the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice. And those are the two fora that I want to speak about in a little bit more detail. Most recently, the controversy with respect to the ICC has been around reports that arrest warrants might be expected at the request of the prosecutor, Karim Khan, against Israelis in the wake of the current conflict and the war in Gaza against Hamas. Now, the notion that arrest warrants would be applied for while this war is continuing, where the UN only a couple of days ago said that due to the fog of war, they were excusing having endorsed unreliable and now it seems wrong statistics in terms of casualties and fatalities. The idea that arrest warrants would be sought in the context of this fog of war against Israelis, when the court has no jurisdiction in respect of Israel, is very concerning for international law generally. The Rome Statute that established the court is importantly, uh, it has not been signed up to by Israel. It has also not been signed up to by the United States. I would argue that there are clear reasons that neither of those states uh, engaged, having been pretty involved in the reasons for the establishment of the ICC, having even been engaged in some of the drafting processes of the Rome Statute, why is it that these two democracies declined to become members, to sign up to the Rome Treaty? Well, I think it became pretty clear the way that some of the text was drafted, in particular the inclusion of certain crimes under Article 8 of the statute, uh, especially uh, the crime of the transfer of populations in the context of occupied territory. The inclusion in that statute of the words direct or indirect were taken as a clear indication that Israel would be targeted as a political issue by this court. And to me, that was an indication at the earliest point of this process of establishing uh, this court that it was going to be, unfortunately, a political um, as opposed to a, a legal institution. And since its establishment, we have seen its woeful track record. The fact that it may now be seeking to gain credibility by jumping on the bandwagon against the Jewish state, well, I'll perhaps leave you to draw your own conclusions on that. The absence of jurisdiction here is critical. And what we saw a number of years ago in the context of another prosecutor at the ICC, Fatou Ben Souda, bringing a request for determination of jurisdiction to pre-trial chamber one, well, the legal acrobatics that were involved in the justification uh, that the court would have jurisdiction in the absence of a state of Palestine and the absence of, there being, uh, of Israel being a signatory to the Rome Statute, I think that leaves an awful lot of questions to be answered. The question of jurisdiction is, of course, not settled. And should arrest warrants be issued in due course, that argument will uh, inevitably play a central role. I'm coming from the United Kingdom, and I think that uh, the UK ought to be extremely aware and cautious of the potential uh, overreach, in particular of the International Criminal Court, because a court that steps out with the parameters that have been laid down in statute, where statute is such a critical element of international law, the principle of states signing up to treaties or conventions, agreeing to be bound by those, uh, is the bedrock of international law. It is what makes international law work. And we lose that uh, at our peril. The credibility that the International Criminal Court uh, still has to operate is also, I think, under threat uh, if it undermines the very basis and the essence of its functioning in that fashion. So that uh, is unfortunately where things sit with the International Criminal Court. And albeit that there were uh, high hopes upon Prosecutor Khan's appointment, uh, he is a member of my own profession, a very respected uh, English barrister,
I was particularly troubled by a speech that he gave when he visited uh, the Rafah crossing and talked about the alleged crimes that Hamas had committed. Those crimes, of course, that have been recorded on GoPro cameras and sent around the world, the evidence of which Hamas is very proudly put out for everyone to see. The alleged crimes of Hamas he referred to before noting that it would be on Israel to prove its adherence to international humanitarian law, the law of armed conflict in Gaza. I, as a member of the bar, was extremely troubled to see the burden and standard of proof so inverted uh, by a colleague. Um, I can only hope that speeches like that, uh, that occurred on the Rafa crossing, but also later um, on that visit in Cairo, don't necessarily manifest in the approach that the prosecutor will take, but we'll have to wait and see. Now, the International Court of Justice, which also sits in The Hague, has been a focus of anti-Israel activity for some time. Um, those in the audience may recall the 2004 Wall Opinion, the so-called Wall Opinion, which uh, addressed the construction of Israel's security barrier. This was a barrier that was built to stem the tide of suicide bombings that Israel was experiencing in the years before uh, construction began. It is uh, a measure, a defensive measure, that by all accounts has been 100% successful uh, in that the buses and markets and discotheques and pizzerias that were the target of these terrorists exploding themselves were spared those consequences as a result of its construction. <coughs> Nonetheless, the reasons for the walls, or the security barrier, or the fence, uh, the reasons for its construction were conspicuously absent from the determinations of the court in relation to that advisory opinion. And that uh, occasioned much criticism, in fact, including in the Israeli Supreme Court, uh, a judgment in particular by Aaron Barak, where he compared the approach taken by the International Court of Justice in that non-binding advisory opinion and contrasted it with the approach taken by the Israeli Supreme Court sitting as the High Court of Justice, which also dealt with petitions and complaints in relation to the security barrier and the route that was taken. And on a meter by meter basis assessed and balanced the security needs against the rights of the individuals that claimed to be impacted by the route that was proposed. And that was a court that did take into account the real reasons behind the construction of that barrier. Now, perhaps we need to be mindful of our criticism. It's true that the uh, International Court of Justice did not have very much material before it that addressed the legitimate concerns of the State of Israel and the security reasons for that barrier. What it did have were significant reports by NGOs and others that alleged uh, falsehoods about Israel's intentions with respect to the barrier. Uh, land grabs, political purposes, that was what was being suggested. And in the absence of proper, reliable, accurate information, there are some that argue that it was inevitable that the court decided as it did and opined as it did in that advisory opinion. This is a significant problem and it presents itself in the current matters before the International Court of Justice also. It has been the subject of a submission by UK Lawyers for Israel and Elnet uh, to the International Court of Justice in respect of a new advisory opinion which it has been asked to consider um, more recently by the General Assembly where the uh, resolution itself that put the matter before the court and requested an advisory opinion, made allegations against Israel. It didn't ask the court to opine on those allegations of illegality, of uh, breaching the Palestinian right to self-determination or any of the other alleged crimes that were suggested. It simply asked the court to consider, to take those as read and to consider what the legal implications of that unlawful conduct should be.
And those that have uh, initiated this process make it clear that they are seeking a blessing by the court for policies including boycotts, divestment and sanctions on the Jewish state as a result. And that is a significant um, factor to bear in mind. It seems to me unprecedented that a request for an advisory opinion to the International Court of Justice essentially doesn't ask the court to opine on the real legal questions that are being put before it. But the question as to whether the court is in fact in a position to address those questions is a significant one. Because if the last advisory opinion is anything to go by, the information before the court is simply not accurate enough. It is simply uh, not reflective of the current situation for the court to be in a position to make an informed uh, and proper analysis. There are two functions that the International Court of Justice serves. The first is uh, as I've described, to provide these advisory opinions to opine on matters of importance in international law, uh, often at the request of the General Assembly of the United Nations. Those opinions are not legally binding, but the other function, important function that the court serves, is to hear disputes between member states of the UN. Uh, these can be in relation to specific treaties, uh, and these determinations are binding as between the parties to that dispute. This is what we see in the context of South Africa's application against Israel and its allegation of genocide, a breach of the Genocide Convention. Now, you will all, I'm sure, be familiar <coughs> with the Provisional Measures Order laid down by the court in January of this year. You may also be familiar with the controversy surrounding the reporting of this provisional measures order. And I was shocked in the days after this order to see that lawyers and media were misrepresenting entirely what it was that the court had determined in setting out the provisional measures. Um, happily, that has now been, uh, in, a, in, in a rather unprecedented fashion, addressed and clarified by the former president of the International Court of Justice, Joan Donoghue, in a Newsnight interview uh, on BBC. A few days uh, after uh, I gave evidence at the Business and Trade Committee in the UK Parliament and made it clear what I considered the order to say. It was not as had been reported around the world that the International Court of Justice had found Israel plausibly guilty of genocide or had found that there was a plausible case of genocide or anything of that sort. No, in the days after that order, I made it clear that all the court had determined was whether South Africa was claiming plausible rights. Now, this might sound like hair splitting, and my apologies to non-lawyers in the audience, but plausible rights mean something very different. It is a question as to whether the rights that South Africa was claiming fell under the Genocide Convention, whether those rights that it was claiming on behalf of the Palestinians in Gaza to be protected by genocide were subject to a legal determination by the court. And the reason that South Africa brought this allegation of genocide is not because there is any factual accuracy or veracity to this allegation, far from it. The reason South Africa brought this allegation of genocide against Israel was because it was a legal hook by which to bring Israel to the International Court of Justice, because Israel is a party to the Genocide Convention. That is the, the process by which South Africa sought to bring Israel before the court. Put aside for a moment the audaciousness, the grotesqueness of alleging genocide against the real victims of genocide. Not just the victims of genocide and the Holocaust, but the victims of acts of genocide on the 7th of October. Acts of genocide perpetrated by Hamas and other Palestinian terrorists that were celebrated by those terrorists and publicized on social media for the world to see. Those victims of real genocide were being accused by South Africa. Now the case that Israel presented to the International Court of Justice 
set out importantly the humanitarian provision that Israel has made and has facilitated throughout this conflict. There is a special unit of the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, COGAT, whose sole purpose is to provide for the needs of civilians in times of armed conflict. And COGAT's updates throughout this conflict, including those presented to the International Court of Justice, make clear the extent of Israel's initiatives and efforts. When I looked at those numbers a few weeks ago and compared them with what the World Food Programme set out was the requirement to feed the total population of the Gaza Strip, the tonnage of humanitarian assistance going in, according to those records, was some three times what was required on those estimates to feed the entire population of the Gaza Strip. Let's bear that in mind in terms of these allegations of starvation or of intentional starvation as a, as a policy or practice by Israel. So Israel presented its case to the International uh, Court of Justice, both in terms of the humanitarian provision, but also in terms of the measures that it takes to prevent civil civilian casualties in armed conflict. And it bears noting that legal and military experts who have visited Gaza in past conflicts uh, and in this one have been clear that the IDF's track record of precaution against civilian casualties and its adherence to the principles of the international humanitarian law, law of armed conflict, proportionality, distinction, necessity, are unparalleled, that other uh, law-abiding armies would struggle to meet the high standards that Israel has set in the context of intense urban armed conflict where Hamas as other Palestinian terrorists, are using civilians as human shields and deploying the law of armed conflict against uh, the abiders of that law, against Israel, by embedding themselves in civilian areas, by using hospitals, uh, clinics, ambulances, uh, schools, um, and, uh, and, and mosques as terror infrastructure. That is the context in which Israel put this information before the International Court of Justice. And it's very important to recognize that that information was not in fact considered when the court drew its conclusions. It did not consider the merits of the case that South Africa was bringing. It did not consider the merits of the response that Israel put forward. It simply considered whether it was plausible that the rights that South Africa was claiming fell under the Genocide Convention. And then when it looked to the questions of urgency and uh, irreparable harm or prejudice, which were important and required for provisional measures to be ordered, well, it's important to recognize that in situations where uh, genocide or ethnic cleansing is alleged, those factors are assumed as a matter of course. Where human life is under threat in such, allegedly under threat to such an extent, then urgency and prejudice are presumed and therefore provisional measures were ordered. But let's consider for a moment the provisional measures that were ordered because the Ugandan dissenting judge, Sebu Tinde, remarked that these uh, measures were redundant. It is important that South Africa did not succeed in its main aim in the case that it brought against Israel and its request for provisional measures, which was a requirement that Israel stop its operation in Gaza immediately. That is not what the court ordered. The court ordered that Israel adhere to its international law obligations under the Genocide Convention, which by all accounts, Israel has uh, plainly been adhering to uh, and will and is committed to continuing to adhere to. The only additional requirement was that Israel provide a report to the court about its initiatives, which it has by all accounts done so. Now, of course, subsequently, there has been uh, a further application by South Africa for additional provisional measures, which was not successful, and a further application by South Africa for provisional measures um, in March, in which um, a slight amendment was made with respect to the provision of uh, international aid. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, these are reflective of Israel's existing international law obligations. So nothing further has been required by the court.
Why is this significant? Because to me, it underpins the political motivation, both behind South Africa's application and behind others that have followed, importantly Nicaragua's application against Germany for provisional measures seeking the court to prevent Germany from transferring arms to Israel. Again, measures which were unsuccessful. The court declined to order that. But all of this is predicated on this allegation that Israel is committing genocide. For the reasons that I described, because this is the legal hook, but also I would suggest for a more troubling reason. And this is where I want to draw my remarks to a close, by offering what I think is an explanation behind the sort of politicization of legal terminology. I was struck many years ago by a description of the evolution of anti-Semitism by the late great uh, former chief rabbi of the United Kingdom, Lord Jonathan Sachs. He described anti-Semitism as a mutating virus. What began in the Middle Ages as a focus on Jewish religion <coughs> brought with it the ancient blood libels of Jews killing Christian children to use their blood to make matzah or to perform religious rituals. In the 20th century, when science took over from religion, as the order of the day, Rabbi Sachs described how the virus of anti-Semitism mutated to focus on the Jewish race. And eugenics, the pseudoscience of eugenics, was used to justify that hatred by the Nazis. Well, Rabbi Sachs continued, and he described how international law and human rights had taken over as the order of the day. And so it was only natural that the modern face of anti-Semitism some may argue the acceptable face of anti-Semitism, manifested itself in a hatred of the Jewish state. And those ancient blood libels are with us, ladies and gentlemen, in a new form. Ethnic cleansing, colonialism, occupation, apartheid, genocide. We let those falsehoods percolate at our peril because this is where the modern anti-Semites focus their initiatives and their actions. And as I mentioned at the start, this is not just problematic for the Jewish state. This should be of concern to every believer in international legal order, in the rule of law. Because when one politicizes these terms, when one uses the law to propagate these falsehoods, every supporter of the rule of law, and I would argue the very fabric of Western liberal democratic society is under threat. And with that, I very much look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for a great talk and for keeping to the time. So we have plenty of time to uh, move into questions and discussion. So we start off, um, you just come back here yes, and talk down there. Um, we all know what happened in the Holocaust. We know that was genocide. But now, as you know, genocide is a, is a word used as a weapon, uh, particularly to attack Israel. But what is the current prevailing legal definition of genocide as we are in 2024? Um, well, the Convention of Genocide, on, uh, the, on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide, uh, provides a definition. It sets out a number of acts, uh, including the killing uh, of, a, of a population or um, the creation of circumstances which make, like, paraphrasing, which, which make life impossible. Um, but the critical element of genocide is intention. And this is the intention to eradicate a religious, uh, ethnic, racial group in whole or in part to eradicate as, uh, a group as such. Um, and that is critical uh, because, again, intention was not something considered by the International Court of Justice. It was very clear that it didn't consider uh, the intention aspect to South Africa's allegations, that this was all something for the merit stage, which may very well be a number of years away. Um, but it's significant also for an additional reason, because when we're looking at armed conflict, it is a tragic fact 
that in war, civilians die. There has never been a war in which civilian casualties have been non-existent, which is why, um, as an uh, international lawyer, I f that focused uh, to an extent on, on the law of armed conflict, I was particularly troubled to hear John Kirby at the start of this war, a military man himself, a former rear admiral and the current spokesman of the National Security Council, saying that the acceptable number of civilian casualties in this war was zero. Any, uh, you don't have to be a military expert to recognize that that is simply not credible. Civilian casualties are an unfortunate reality of armed conflict. But the intention is critical, not just to the crime of genocide, also to how one applies international humanitarian law. Mm. IHL is not an effects-based analysis. When you hear people saying Israel has been disproportionate because more Palestinian civilians have been killed, allegedly, than those that were killed, those Israelis that were killed on the, on the 7th of October. That is not how proportionality works. That is not how international law works. If it did, it would provide a disgusting incentive, additional incentive, to Hamas generating as many civilian casualties as possible with its policy of human shields. No, international humanitarian law is an intention-based analysis. Proportionality requires the reasonable military commander to weigh up the anticipated uh, concrete direct military advantage against the anticipated collateral damage. Intention, not effect space. And likewise, the crime of genocide requires the intention to eradicate a people. It is what happened in the Holocaust. It is what happened when 4,000 terrorists crossed the border on the 7th of October looking to kill Jews. It is a disgusting blood libel to make that allegation against the State of Israel. Thank you very much for a very clear very informative and most interesting presentation that only a barrister could do. But can I say that in the hopeless situation that you described in so many ways, it reminded me of that phrase, the power will do what they can and the weak will suffer what they must. Where do we move past that point? I have to confess, I don't quite follow what, what is being suggested. I mean, many people have looked at the Middle East conflict as a David and Goliath situation. Those that see Israel as the Goliath in that equation, I would encourage them to look at a map and look at Israel amongst the sea of very hostile countries and recognize what the real David and Goliath equation is. Now, I say that and I caveat that since the uh, incredible development of the Abraham Accords, because Israel is no longer alone in the region. And the, yeah, of course, the so uh, the miracle, uh, what if you'd asked former Secretary of State John Kerry would have just simply been impossible. In fact, in, in 2016 at the Saban conference, Kerry uh, uttered the words that I imagine he is now very embarrassed by. I think it went something like this. Mark my words, there will never be a separate peace between Israel and the Arab world without the solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. More or less. Well, uh, when the Abraham Accords came about and Israel's relationship with Saudi Arabia uh, forgive me, that is, hopefully, that is wishful thinking, Freudian slip. Um, Israel's relationship with the UAE, uh, with, with um, Morocco uh, and others, uh, came to fruition. There were many in Israel that had been working towards this and anticipating it for some time, but it was under the leadership and the Trump administration um, and teams working uh, very hard behind the scenes to facilitate this coming together. Undoubtedly, these normalization agreements, peace agreements, uh, undoubtedly encouraged by the Iranian threat um, and the previous withdrawal of America from the region of the Middle East has caused countries that find themselves on the other side of that equation, uh, targeted by Iran in Iranian proxies, like Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, um, they, they have come together. 
And that, in the context of the Abraham Accords, um, put the lie to that previous American uh, theory, dogma. Uh, but it also opened up opportunities potentially with Saudi Arabia. And there are some that argue that if Israel and Saudi had been on the cusp of a similar agreement, then the 7th of October was planned in order to try and frustrate that. I think there were a number of reasons and motivations for it. But in the context of the Abraham Accords, what we are seeing is the prospect of a, of a new Middle East. Um, where we have come from is that David and Goliath situation that I described. And it is certainly disquieting that Israel has seemingly enjoyed international support when it was seen as weak, but the moment it was able to defend itself, and defense and deterrence is critical in the Middle East. The only way to achieve peace and quiet with the likes of Iran on your doorstep, as it is on Israel's southern and northern border, is deterrence. And that is being eaten away. The direct strike by Iran on Israel was unprecedented. It came on the back of weeks of damaging American rhetoric. I believe that gave Iran a green light, a green light to undertake something it had never dared before. There was a reason that it always used proxies to attack Israel previously and felt able to go that additional step further on an attack that was calculated to cause maximum damage. Anyone that suggests that uh, Israel was easily able to shoot the barrage of uh, ballistic uh, cruise missiles and drones that Iran fired towards the Jewish state, that Israel was easily able to, to, to deal with those, uh, I'm afraid is sadly mistaken. The fact that the unprecedented operation of Iron Dome, Chetz, uh, and David Sling together with an international coalition that took out a substantial uh, number of those projectiles before they reached Israel. Unprecedented. Uh, the fact that that was able to withstand that attack is nothing short of a miracle, a technological miracle, and testament to the incredible ingenuity of Israeli uh, defense industries. Uh, but there is no doubt as to what Iran intended with that strike. Um, so all of those factors need to be taken into account when one considers the dynamic, um, sir, that I think you described. Uh, Natasha, thank you very much for a very eloquent, um, eloquent lecture. Um, you mentioned at the outset um, the building of the uh, wall by Israel at, on the West Bank, or around the West Bank, in order to prevent the influx of terrorists into, um, into Israel. Um, that appeared to be somewhat legally controversial, and yet there is a even greater uh, wall built between Egypt and Gaza, preventing, not terrorists, but preventing one single refugee from coming into the otherwise empty Sinai Desert. Mm. Now, if you look at the Syrian yeah, war, yeah, Syrian war, there were massive uh, ad, uh, refugees went to all the neighboring countries. What is the legal situation? I assume okay. e Egypt is not a signatory, okay. but what is the legal situation about refugees into Egypt? Egypt is a signatory to the African Union Convention on Refugees. It acceded to that treaty in 1980. That is significant because the definition of refugee under the African Union Convention is even broader than under the International Convention. It includes individuals fleeing civil disorder. Egypt has a responsibility to do everything in its power to assist every Palestinian that presented themselves, Palestinian civilian, that presented themselves on the border with Egypt. Rafa. The failure of Egypt to comply with the legal obligations that it signed itself up to. I mentioned earlier how important treaties were in the international legal order. Is serious. The absence of commentary on that failure in the international community is inexplicable. Israel is not in a position to to make that case, the peace treaty that Israel has enjoyed with Egypt is precarious at best. 
there are diplomatic considerations that the Jewish state has to contend with. But any international commentator that laments the position of Palestinian uh, refugees or, or Palestinian civilians in the Gaza Strip, as I do, if they refrain from calling on Egypt to comply with its international law obligations and facilitate the humanitarian provision for these civilians, the other side of the Rafah crossing, in Egyptian Rafah, where aid can be provided to these civilians without diversion to Hamas, I do not believe that they truly care about the uh, plight of Palestinian civilians. Because if they did, that is what they would be calling for, to set up an, in, uh, an internationally supported tent city, the other side, in the Sinai, where they could be provided for adequately. Instead, what we see is the international community threatening Israel that if it acts in accordance with its international law rights of self-defense, if it continues to seek to release the hostages that are held in, the Raf in Rafa, if it seeks to continue to target Hamas terrorists that are hiding out in Rafa, then as President Biden threatened, the arms supply will be turned off. That is an inversion of, uh, well, what the international community, I believe, uh, should be responsible for which is supporting Israel in this war, which it is fighting not just on its own behalf, but on behalf of Western interests everywhere. Because let's be clear, Iran uh, has been vocal that its initial target is Israel, but it's Western liberal democratic values around the world that it seeks to go after next. Israel is at the vanguard of this. Israel is fighting our war for us. And to the extent that the responsibilities under international law of Egypt, that the real provision for these Palestinian civilians that could be made have been left out of the international discourse, I have to question the motivations of those engaging in it. Just a brief point before I go to the Zoom question. You may have seen today or heard today that Egypt's joined the South African um, um, action. Yes. What, what's the implications of that, just briefly? Um, so I described earlier that South Africa's application, uh, I thought, was a, was a political stunt um, as opposed to one that was justified in, in any international law. The fact that Egypt is joining on to this political stunt uh, probably highlights the desire for it to distract from its own responsibilities, those that we have just been discussing. We've got a question from Paul in Sydney. Could Israel bring an action under the Genocide Convention against the United Nations itself? because of the alleged participation of UNWA staff uh, in the uh, October the 7th uh, attack? So the United Nations and UNRWA in particular, um, well, there's, there's the, the issue of uh, legal immunity uh, attached to UN bodies, which is a serious difficulty. There is, I believe now, uh, an action in the United States that targets US domestic funding uh, for UNRWA on the basis of its complicity, not just in the 7th of October atrocities, but um, Hamas terrorism more generally. I think one thing we need to remember and recall is the impact that UNRWA has had in perpetuating this conflict even before the 7th of October. 4,000 terrorists don't just wake up one morning and decide that it's a good day to slaughter Jews. These 4,000 individuals that crossed the border had been indoctrinated. About three quarters of them, according to UN statistics, were educated in UNRWA-run schools. Educated to believe that the highest calling in life was to become a martyr and to kill as many Jews as possible. So the responsibility that the United Nations has, and that UNRWA has in particular, runs far deeper than the relatively shocking allegations of UNRWA employees being directly involved in the 7th of October massacre and others celebrating it subsequently, including teachers' WhatsApp groups. Again, the NGO uh, UN Watch has put out several reports now on this information. Um, so unfortunately, the, the legal uh, avenues for challenge uh, are limited, but that is why the international um, cessation or at least suspension of funding for this organization which is at the heart of perpetuating the supposed refugee crisis 
uh, passing down Palestinian refugee status generation to generation and perpetuating the conflict with the promise that once Israel is wiped off of the map, these individuals will be settled uh, in Israeli towns and cities. That really does bear addressing by the international community. Uh, thank you, Natasha. Very comprehensive, particularly in view of the way our country has voted in the United Nations over the weekend. I want to talk about governance. Uh, you mentioned the question of the relevance of the current conflict extending beyond the borders, particularly in the terms of the universal caliphate. In terms of Islam, there are obviously major divisions between the Sunnis and the Shiites and between multiple subgroups of both. Who speaks on behalf of Islam? How is it related to Hamas? So I, I am not a scholar uh, on religion. Uh, but for my part, I have always sought to draw a distinction between Islam and Islamism and the sort of extremism that we have seen. Uh, that the We've discussed Iran quite a little bit this evening, and I, and I should be clear that my references have been to the Islamic Republic, not to the Iranian people, who I think are as, well, far more so the victims uh, of Islamist extremism uh, in the Islamic Republic. Um, and we have seen, I, I think, um, the international community absolutely letting down the ordinary people, the ordinary Iranian people, women in particular, people who have been protesting and seeking to topple this regime for many years now. Um, who speaks on behalf of a religion is always a, um, a fraught topic, uh, and there are clearly many different manifestations. But what we need to be clear on and robust about is that Islam should never be used as a shield uh, or a justification for the sorts of atrocities that we saw on the 7th of October and that we have seen throughout the Middle East. You know, it's one thing when there is a focus on Israel and it is in the headlines every single day. But the Muslim victims of, Islamist, of Islamism and Islamist extremism around the Middle East have been forgotten. There are people being tortured and murdered on a daily basis that are not covered by the international media, that are not the subject of repeated headlines day after day. And they are those Muslims are uh, the real victims, just as those Jews who were slaughtered and those atrocities that were committed. Um, it is important that the religion has been used as a means to facilitate the indoctrination that I spoke about previously. It is a very powerful mechanism. It is a very powerful delivery mechanism uh, for, for that sort of radicalization. And um, having mentioned the Abraham Accords, I think it's very significant that the UAE and also Saudi now have substantial experience in de-radicalization. Because the, the de-radicalization, the denazification process which will be necessary in Gaza after this war will require uh, an international effort. This should not be the responsibility of Israel alone. And I do anticipate and hope that the Abraham Accords countries will, uh, will take a, a leading role in that, bringing to bear the experience that they have inevitably gained over several years now. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Given the United Nations performance over the last several years, um, is there a leg legitimate argument that uh, Australia certainly, the UK, the America and various other countries ignore the United Nations now as a forum for attempting to resolve international disputes. So as with many of these international organizations, the argument that I have heard relatively powerfully advanced by diplomats is that the main purpose is to facilitate bilateral engagement discussions. And in fact, the conversations that happen in the corridors of the United Nations are always far more important than what happens in the resolutions themselves. 
And I see that on the basis that the reality and the relationships between even Israeli diplomats and diplomats of countries that won't recognize Israel. Nevertheless, that the personal relationships between these individuals who work side by side in many of these organizations are critical. And no doubt we saw the impact uh, of that people to people interaction in the context of the Abraham Accords and other um, economic agreements that have been achieved. Uh, but the United Nations is long overdue in terms of it no longer being fit for purpose. I mean, many, many years ago uh, in Israel, the, the phrase um shum came to, uh, came to be a bit of a catchphrase. Who cares about the United Nations? We know what their agenda is. We know that they're not democratic. We know that there is an inbuilt majority against Israel. We know what they put out is simply false. Uh, but unfortunately, that factors into you know, what we have been discussing this evening, which is the international uh, lawfare against Israel. It's important to recall that the resolutions that are passed at the United Nations against Israel are not legal. They have been invariably political rather than legal. Every General Assembly resolution does not have a legal basis. They are political uh, recommendations. And even in the Security Council, Security Council resolutions only have legal teeth if they are passed under Chapter 7. The vast majority of uh, resolutions are passed under Chapter 6. There is one important Chapter 7 resolution that was passed in the wake of September 11th, Resolution 1373, which bears recognizing. That was a resolution that required all member states of the United Nations to take steps against international terrorism. I would argue that is a resolution that requires all member states of the United Nations to act in concert with Israel against the scourge of Hamas and Hezbollah, to stop the funding and financing through international markets and bank transfers, and to stand by Israel's side as it is fighting this international terrorism. So there are aspects of UN resolutions that are critical here, especially in the fight against terrorism. What an indictment that they're being overlooked. Oh, yeah, Itasha, you're such an impressive advocate. And in the David and Goliath metaphor that we've used a bit tonight, you're really in the, in the David camp. And I'm amazed at how you do what you do. So in this terrible battle against propaganda, which reaches into the law, the law and whatever, how do you work, your organisation and those who work in the way you work. Can you tell us a little bit about the networks that are really the Davids fighting the Goliath? Um, well, thank you for the very kind words. I am extremely privileged to have volunteered for UK Lawyers for Israel for over 10 years and to have a family, a, a voluntary association of other lawyers that recognise the lawfare that we have been discussing this evening, the abuse of law, and recognize the importance of using law appropriately, making sure that it is applied. Most of our work, this is gonna sound very English, uh, we write letters. We write letters pointing out breaches of law, pointing out legal obligations of local government, of companies that may be involved in uh, unknowingly may be involved in the funding of terrorism um, and we ensure that the law is properly applied to Israel, to Israelis uh, in the context of fighting anti-Semitism and that may be quiet and it may be uh, laborious but it is remarkably effective. It's not as headline grabbing as litigating and uh, you know the Americans keep asking us why why we just don't sue the uh, the, the I, I won't go there um, but uh, but it's extremely effective and we're I think blessed to have the support of a wonderful group of patrons as well who are some of the most senior respected former judges and lawyers uh, in the United Kingdom and I'm also very blessed to come from a legal tradition which has a real respect and credibility around the world. The common law is one of the UK's 
uh, most successful exports, uh, I would advocate. And the tradition that we have of upholding the rule of law and justice and truth is one that I am very uh, privileged to say uh, is a driving factor amongst all of those that I have had the honor to work with uh, at UK Lawyers for Israel. And I can only say that in the last seven months, the work has exploded, but the influx of volunteers has also been overwhelming. And people care, and people are willing to stand up and be counted. And now, more than ever, the metal is being tested. I don't feel like the David in this equation, because I stand on the shoulders of many Goliaths, and uh, we won't be cowed. This is uh, a fight that I know uh, will probably take the majority of, of, of our lives, but it's a real privilege to be involved in it. Um, and that sense of purpose is one that I'm extremely honored to have. So, uh, our speaker's got another engagement, and I'll be very brief. I first should say it's great to have another letter writer on the podium. We, do, we obsessively write letters at the Sydney Institute, yeah. Uh, well, I do, do I? I see. Uh, so many thanks to Natasha Hostorf for a great analysis tonight and a very strong person here stating a very strong cause and telling us about international law and in particular international lawfare. So great talk tonight. We'll publish it, be up on our website, be filmed, and well done. And good luck. <laughs>